In our last episode of Home Study, we brought up the subject of goats, and we tried to figure out whether or not we could find a good reason that any homesteader would want to have them on the property. So far, all we could come up with was this. Adorable. <laughs> oh, they are so, so cute. Yeah. Goats are adorable. Goats are cute, at least when they're babies. And that was Mike and Lauren, who we interviewed last time. Mike and Lauren shared with us their homesteading tales about buying two baby goats, chickens, and the time they spent on their small homestead. Mike and Lauren found that goats did not really save them any money or earn them any money, much like I myself have found being a goat owner for the last four years or so. We're about ready to give up, but then I stumbled across the Instagram account of Brittany Colbush. Brittany Colbush considers herself a modern shepherdess. Her entire life is built around the idea of shepherding, whether that be animals, people, or the land itself. Could she do it? Could she convince us that goats are a worthwhile enterprise for your homestead? Could she convince accountant Mike of this? Let's jump in and see if Brittany Colbush can give us any explanation as to how goats could be a good decision for a homesteader. I found Brittany on Instagram. She has a amazing Instagram account. The pictures look like they're out of a calendar that someone would put up in their cubicle to transport them to a life where they're a shepherdess overlooking mountains and mountains of greenery and goats. If that calendar doesn't exist, then that's something we need to market. Anyway, Brittany's Instagram account is full of these pictures. And in lots of the pictures, there's what looks like hundreds of animals. I figured if she's working with that many animals, surely she's figured out a way to make money off of them and make it a sustainable business. I reached out to her and she said she'd be up for an interview. And so I gave her a call. I'm the eldest of six daughters from a beach town in Southern California, North Campus, San Diego. That's Rue. <laughs> Second. I got a, a guard dog border collie. <laughs> hey, Rue. When you're interviewing a modern shepherdess, expect sheepdog interruptions. Brittany was the oldest of six children. She grew up in a small town in northern San Diego. I'm, I didn't come from agriculture in the least. I uh, grew up my time as a kid, um, you know, exploring tide pools and uh, hiking cliff sides and things like this, uh, overlooking the ocean. Um, it was a long and winded road to where she is now, but she's found her calling. Proudly say I am a through and through livestock gal. Um, I self-identify as a land steward using small ruminants as a land management tool. And they're also my friends and they're also, um, you know, what drives my way of life now and my livelihood. You took my hand and pulled me. Out of reach from my hopes and dreams. Brittany didn't start her life off with the goal of becoming a shepherdess. She left high school, and after spending one semester in college and realizing that she wasn't ready for it, she moved to Mexico. I lived in Mexico City for almost two years wow, okay. uh, after I graduated high school. Something that's very different, I would say, within our culture and the culture below the border in, in Mexico, our relationship to food and how food is has shared and pervade meat in open markets yeah there isn't the same type of um, really tight regulations <laughs> yes. after high school I went and spent a couple months with an uncle of mine in Mexico I remember walking through the markets. It's something that's almost unbelievable to us. You would walk through this market. It was an open air market. There'd be sides of beef hanging from the ceiling. People coming up and picking cuts. Men slicing pieces off and handing it to them. And there were flies buzzing around and there was no air conditioner. There'd be tables filled with fish. This was the way that everyone came and bought their meat. No air conditioners, no coolers, lots of flies. And yet, 
Lots of smiling faces, music, festivities, people cooking tortas on the side of the road and selling them. It was definitely a vibrant and alive community. You could tell. We went, we bought our food, brought it home, cooked it up, and nobody got sick. And I witnessed such an incredible vibrancy within these communities. And I wondered why, you know, my family didn't experience that in these, these, um, this kind of suburban sprawl. Why, why didn't we know our neighbors? Why weren't we eating, eating in the streets? Why, why weren't we sharing? And so my big quandary when I left home was how do we accommodate a growing population and also preserve a culture of sharing and caring and celebration? And I, what I realized that the root of all, of all of that community that I was witnessing as a kid was actually based out of food and sharing with food. That quest to bring people together and unite them in a close community using the power of good food, it was a long and meandering path that eventually led Brittany to being a modern day shepherdess. The quickest way to describe it is I feel it, that it was a calling. Um, in, 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 in a literal sense, uh, I just kept on following the breadcrumbs that led me to opportunities. And when doors came, uh, I pushed them down. <laughs> and <laughs> now, multiple years later, I've managed over 2,000 head of livestock all over the Bay Area in the urban periphery. And I've been a member of, of, of leading contract grazing operations in the state of California. Brittany's managed over 2,000 head of livestock. That said, she doesn't actually own that much livestock herself. She calls herself a... I'm more like a, a goat broker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll find, I'll find a, a project that might need you know, goats to do you know, some vegetation management, and I will work with both the client and the operation to develop the best um, grazing program for that job. So as a goat broker, Brittany works with large herds and large grazing contracts. Most of us homesteaders are not going to have a very large herd. And so I thought it would be better to base our numbers off of Brittany's personal herd. I think there's awesome and tremendous opportunity for little contract grazing like my 12 goats. Right now I'm doing contract grazing with 12 goats. But I'm actually doing a very small project right now where I'm charging two bucks a head uh, for the goats to graze on a, a very small piece of property. And I'm also adding on my labor expense, transportation expense, um, incidentals, and depending on scale, uh, insurance. In the future, I do intend to have uh, the stacked enterprises of seasonal meat and also, um, and also hides. Uh, hides is another aspect too. Awesome. So Brittany's small homestead size herd makes her money in multiple ways. She charges $2 per head on the animal to work the land per day. In the future, she's also going to expand her enterprises into the world of meat and hides. The great part is that $2 a day figure, that covers the expenses right out of the gate. So those $2 a head per day takes into consideration my electric fence, my charger, my solar panel, my deep cycle battery, my water tank, all of those things. That is separate from my labor because I have to I have to value my time. This is the other important key as to why Brittany's business is working. She doesn't just charge for the animals. She charges for her time too. And of all the things I do, chasing goats around is not the most lucrative one. Um, I have to set a rate for my time. And even if it's very low to start, um, we have to design from the get-go business models that take into account viability. Brittany got into all the details of what she likes to charge for each project, how much time it takes, and if you really want to dive in and learn about how to make a goat herd business profitable, you can listen to the Pioneers Only episode in the Pioneer Library making a goat herd profitable. Become a pioneer and you'll get access to that entire interview. But at the end of the day, all the math done, Brittany's making about $30 an hour off of her goat herd. She's getting paid $30 an hour, which a lot of people would 
love to be getting paid $30 an hour to do something that they didn't like. Brittany's getting paid this to spend time in some of the most beautiful scenery you can imagine, outside with her animals. And it's not all easy and lovely. She's got a pretty funny video on her Instagram feed where she's wrestling with a wheelbarrow full of fencing and it's probably, I'm guessing, a hot summery day in California somewhere. So don't romanticize it too much. It is hard work, but it's work that she views as, remember, her calling. Are you doing right now the work that you're getting paid to do? Do you look at it as your calling? I don't mean this in a weird metaphysical way. I just mean, is it the job that you feel like you're best suited for in the whole world? For me, that's probably podcasting. I've always loved to talk and perform in front of an audience. And now I have an audience around the entire world that plugs in and listens to me ramble for about an hour. It's perfect. What about you? Do you have something that you love to do, that you're getting paid to do, that not only fills your wallet, but fills your happiness, makes you feel good? I feel like I'm doing my calling. And you could be too. And I'm not saying that your life's calling is working with goats. Trust me, mine isn't. But if it is, well, Brittany proves it can be done. Brittany's not done with her life's work either. She's not stopping. She has big plans for the future. Big plans that include helping others who view this as their life's calling make it a reality. The Shepherding School of the West is an ongoing project to create a vocation program to teach people how to develop uh, viable grazing businesses that will steward our landscapes and using uh, shepherding um, in open spaces uh, as, as the means to do. Um, if you want to learn more and stay tuned for the development uh, in that school, uh, go ahead and sign up on my email list uh, on my website, BrittanyColeBush.com and you can find updates uh, in the development of that project. I'm really excited to hear more about the Shepherding School of the West. And if you are too, you can follow Brittany over at her website. And of course, you can find her where I did, over at her Instagram account, full of beautiful pictures of goats on hillsides. Just search Brittany Colebush in Instagram. G'day, Ost. It's Adam from Tasmania in Australia here. Um, Homesteady pioneer and love the show. Um, just sharing my uh, silly goat story of escaping goats. Um, we have uh, about a dozen goats on the farm um, and they love to get out through the fences. Um, we have electric fences, but they don't seem to have a lot of impact on these particular goats. Um, I was in bed one morning, um, just having an unusual sleep in, and I could hear the goats making a whole lot of noise, um, much louder than usual, and I thought, what the hell is that? I, um, I got up, walked out into the, the entranceway of the house. Um, we have a, a large glass um, ceiling above the entranceway, and I could hear the goats really loudly, and I looked up, and there, right above my head, was the billy goat standing there. I was looking straight up between his legs. Um, I took a quick side step so that in case the glass broke and went outside and the whole flock of goats was standing on the roof. We have an unusual house. It's, it's a turfed roof, so there's always fresh green grass up there that doesn't get eaten. So it's no great surprise that they were up there um, although it was a shock the first time it happened. Anyway, love the show. Um, I hope this recording works out. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Adam, love how you said at the end there, it was a shock the first time it happened. That is an awesome Homesteady Pioneer shout out all about goats and uh, from our friends down in Australia or up in Australia. I guess it all depends on how you look at the world, right, guys? You can be on top too. Um, we have a lot of fans out in Australia, so just a good chance to say hello to all you, especially you homesteady pioneers who help keep the show going. And thanks for that great story, Adam. Now, enough shenanigans. 
it's time to make the phone call that we've been putting off this entire episode, where we have to try to convince a highly analytical, data-driven decision-making accountant that I should be keeping my goats on this farm. Yeah, I'm here. For those of you who don't know him, this is my farm accountant and best friend, Accountant Mike. Can turn it on. Um, um, also, we probably do better with drinks. I forgot to pour myself a drink. Uh, Are you drinking? No, I'm on my crazy right. diet. Right, solidarity. <laughs> you should have something, though. Have something for me. <laughs> you have to explain to the listeners, because I think this will be the first time they hear you completely dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on these things. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what are you guys doing? Why are you guys not drinking? Tell the listeners. Well, that's right, because we're recording. Um, it's called yeah. the Whole30 Challenge, I think. Uh, or something else. The whole 30 something. Anyway, it's kind of like a uh, crazy detox. Pretty much, I can eat anything that's natural. You said that like a question. <laughs> what is natural? What is? <laughs> I can eat pretty much any kind of eggs and meat, that sort of thing, which is good. You're not allowed to have sugar, dairy, grains of any kind, uh, legumes, which apparently is a fancy-ish word for, like, beans. Um, okay, so hold on, hold on, hold the phone. Yeah. How are you allowed to eat natural things, but sugar, dairy, yes. and beans? Yes, I know, I don't know. I don't claim to understand how this program works, all right? It just... <laughs> you can eat anything natural except for anything that grows that's a bean. Right. Screw them. No beans. <laughs> No carbs. That's the other thing that's on this diet. I knew I was forgetting something yeah. big. Well, yeah, every diet ever is just no carbs. No. Right. Sorry, food pyramid. Yeah. Back in the day when we could eat six loaves of bread. <laughs> <laughs> and like, one gotta thing eat my six loaves of bread today. Yeah. What was Atkins? The all best about? diet. <laughs> no, Atkins was the total anti. Oh, like, was he really? All the meat. All the bacon you want, but no, uh, you couldn't ever have a piece of bread. Oh, Atkins. Whatever happened to that guy? I think they, I think he died. Oh, well, <laughs> diet totally doesn't work very him. well. <laughs> oh, he died in 2003. Oh, man. Oh, 72. He did die. Yeah, he's dead. All right, that's, 72 is a pretty good 72 number. 72 is right? good, like, yeah. Before things start getting real bad, but right. like... You've had enough. I don't know. Everyone out there listening who's like 65 right now is really mad at us. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, you can't put a number on it, but like, yeah, there are some people who are just, they're so old that there's no, there's no quality of life left. And that's very, that's sad to see. Sorry, this got super depressing real fast, but <laughs> no. yeah, I, I don't, thanks I don't. For, thanks for listening to Parting Words <laughs> with Accountant Mike. <laughs> Dealing with death, 101. <laughs> the podcast where Mike talks to your dying relatives and tries to make them feel Man, better. Can you imagine, can you think of a worse job for me other than, like, near-death counselor? <laughs> I don't know if that's a job, but... Although, I gotta be honest, I think I nailed it with the name of the podcast. Parting words. Parting words. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Look at you. You are good with words. Yeah, definitely. All right. All Let's right. uh we got before we dive into goats here there's a video that I want to wa I want you to watch okay. and um, I wanted to show accountant Mike a video that Mike and Lauren this is going to get a little confusing <laughs> uh had made about how much your free time is worth often when me and accountant Mike are breaking down a topic we try to figure out whether or not spending time taking care of chickens or goats makes good sense on the homestead and Mike and Lauren have a really good video about what is your free time worth and what metric to compare that to. I wanted to count at Mike's opinion on whether or not we should weigh our free time against our hourly wage. On three. On three. It. One, two, three. All right. Ah, oh, check, 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 one, two. I think I'm a pretty rational person, but when it comes to valuing my free time, uh, I think logic takes a back seat. Say you make $20 an hour you get offered overtime to come in for an extra hour on a Saturday morning. You're gonna make time and a half, so that's an extra $30 in your pocket. 
It's but not really thirty dollars in your pocket. You have to pay taxes on it. Lauren. <laughs> Instead, you decide to spend your Saturday morning doing a little yard work. So you put on your grass dyed tennis shoes and you walk yard. out to the garage to pull out the lawn mower. The salesperson walks up and they say that they'll do all of your yard work for sixty dollars. Do you pull out your wallet? No. Probably not. Why is that? If you consider your Saturday morning hours more valuable than thirty dollars by turning down that overtime then why wouldn't you pay someone else to take care of your chores? Anyone else think Accountant Mike would make a good candidate for the reboot of Mystery Science Theater? I don't have a great answer for that. But I do know that simply calculating your hourly wage and then applying it to all of your free time is neither accurate nor realistic. An hour spent working at your job is simply not the same as an hour spent cooking dinner every night, even though you have to do both. In other words, you'd have to pay me more than my hourly wage to add an hour to my commute to work every day, but I wouldn't spend more than my hourly wage just to avoid cooking dinner every night. And there's a laundry list of things that we do that make no financial sense if you're using the hourly wage formula. Taking care of our chickens had a miserably low rate of return. Uh, we never really kept track of how much time we spent on them, but even if it was just an hour a month, we were saving the equivalent of less than minimum wage. Pretty much anything Mike makes makes little to no financial sense. Mike spent two days pounding out copper so that he could save $20 on cups for Moscow mules. But if not by hourly wage, how do we value our time? There's no black and white answer, but there are three factors that we consider when deciding how to spend our time. Will the time spent in question be pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant? I personally find time in the shop working on things like the letters or the copper cups as pleasant, so it doesn't necessarily need to be a positive financial gain. It's something I enjoy. In fact, it can occasionally cross over into the expense category. Alternatively, time spent with my arms in the greasy cavity of a car engine are generally neutral or unpleasant, so they need to be either financially neutral or financially positive. Question two, does the time spent make you a better person? And finally, does the time spent lead to new skills and or physical activity? In the case of the shop or car or home repairs, the answer is yes to both. Not only are you learning new skills and gaining an overall understanding of how things work and work together, but you're also working up a sweat. And as we know, creating is more rewarding than consuming. So let's go back to the beginning. Is an extra hour of overtime a pleasant experience to better yourself and learn new skills? If it's what you do every day, then probably not. What about yard work? I would say it's a neutral or possibly pleasant way to get some physical activity, so I wouldn't pay someone else to do it. An hour commute is an unpleasant way to get no physical activity. While cooking at home might be a neutral or pleasant experience that might net in some positive health benefits. So we wouldn't pay someone to do it for us. So there you have it. I guess you could have titled this video, How to Rationalize Irrational Financial Habits or Behavior. Or you could just call it Thinking Out Loud to the Camera or Answering Your Why. But that's it. Hope you enjoyed. Bye. Bye guys. What's your take on that? Um, I think that they have a, that's a pretty decent metric where they've got a couple of different things they're talking about. They're talking about... So let's go through the first one. That question, pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. Mm -hmm. If you're spending time doing something that's pleasant, then it doesn't have to make financial sense. Oh, you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, totally. But it has to be... And, and you've said, I mean, when we do this breakdown, you've often said, if you enjoy doing this, and you know you spend your whole Saturday picking berries or whatever, then yeah, go for it. Enjoy yeah, it. yeah, totally. Um, what is something you enjoy that others may not, that others may pay for? I am getting to a point where I like making drinks, and I'm getting good enough at it. Where I said this the other night to Liana, like. There are some drinks that I just don't feel like I want to go pay someone to make for me. Like, I enjoy making them, and they're good, and I realize that's a small example, but that's the, the one no, that, like, a good popped one. up into my mind big time. Like that's actually, that's actually a great one, because I'm sure there are people out there who, okay, I cannot make a mojito to save my life. No. <laughs> It's because you you, you do some, a fifty fifty ratio for everything. <laughs> I know. If somebody held a gun to my head and said, "Make me a mojito," a I would think that person was incredibly twisted. <laughs> <laughs> but b I would definitely be shot. <laughs> I'm trying to think what's something that. Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> Butcher an animal. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds so awful. <laughs> <laughs>
when I say it like next to making a cocktail. Yeah. But yeah, I I enjoy. I don't know. This is gonna make me sound sick to say like I enjoy the butchering process. <laughs> no, it's a no. I can. It's a process. Yeah, there's a craft you know? to it. Yeah, there's, there's a craft yeah. To that's it. that's the word. There's a craft to it. It's something that you. It's not just a. It's not a push of a button thing. It's a skill, and it's something where if you're good at it, I can totally see how you would enjoy it. Sure. So that question kind of, or that idea leads into does does the time spent make you a better person or lead to a new skill slash physical activity? So for you, making cocktails, that's a new, that's a skill. Sure. Yeah. And the whole accountant thing doesn't work out. You could be one of those like fancy bartenders, uh, you know, (laughs) fancy bartenders with like, you got to juggle things and light things on fire. (laughs) Oh, I would not be good at that. (laughs) No juggling thing. This kind of gauge, you kind of agree with it. This scale of is it pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? Does it lead to a new skill or physical activity? Let's dive in to a giant waste of time, which is owning goats. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, nice segue. (laughs) In the last five years that we've been at this, you know, farm here we have owned like many many goats yeah every goat i bought for more money than i sold it (laughs) financially wise goats have done nothing but lose me money mike and lauren did a breakdown and i'll play you let's go to that video next and it was actually a video that they so i played accountant mike the video for mike and lauren's channel about homesteading and he got the point goats cost them money too but obviously they don't they don't present any kind of thumbs up opportunity here no no well, that's <laughs> so <laughs> so before we like just enjoy talking about making cocktails and hang up the phone here <laughs> i i found somebody who's making it work oh so i explained to mike the challenge that he had set before him On the one end, we have me, Mike and Lauren, and all those other goat hobbyists who have a couple of animals who wind up just costing them money hand over fist. On the other side, we have people like Brittany Colbush, who, while still maintaining a small number in their herd, are really making a financial go out of this enterprise on their farm. Mike had to weigh the two and try to figure out what was most likely going to happen with most people bringing goats onto their homestead. To make a good decision, first Mike wanted to know what was Brittany really making on this goat enterprise at the very end of the day. Two dollars a head per day. Times that by per head. Seven days a week. So I went through all the numbers with Mike. The two dollars per head per day, the figure that she charges per week. We talked about how some weeks she might spend 20 hours, while other weeks less if things went well. Then Mike did what he did best. What do you need? What are? What else do you need to know? Oh, I think I know what I need to know. And nice. even though it's great that she's positive, I mean it's not bad, but it's not great. You know, like okay, here's the thing. So she's making thirty-three dollars an hour, which means she, but let's say anybody, is making thirty-three bucks an hour, but they own their own business, right? Yep. I my first thought comes to a tax standpoint thought is california so it's perfect so let's say she works 52 weeks a year that means she is making gross before expenses thirty three thousand one hundred and seventy six dollars a year which maybe i I mean it's true i live in expensive part of the country thirty three thousand is not a lot of money where i am and especially once you consider what i'm going to do next When you own your own business, you've got to pay self-employment tax, and then you've got to pay pay income tax. You're living in California, so it's high income tax rates. Remember that number, 33 So Mike started to work his tax magic. I don't know if you can call it magic. Maybe like tax black magic. And bibbidi-bobbidi-boop, he turned that beautiful figure of $30,000 plus into... So that 33 becomes like 22. Man, love that. Ooh. And so that 22 means you're making like 1800 bucks a month. Which, obviously, to live in one of the more expensive areas in the world is not great. 
At this point, it seemed like Mike was definitely going to give this a thumbs down. Now, to be fair, we couldn't compare what Britney's business was doing because that's not what we were deciding here. Brittany Colbush is doing a great job running a business as a goat broker, and she's got this herd on the side, and she's got a lot of different enterprises going on. And so, of course, she's handling things the right way. But that's not what Mike was trying to decide. He was trying to decide whether or not someone with 12 goats, just that enterprise alone, could make a go of it. So although I couldn't use the whole goat broker aspect to get a thumbs up, I did remind Mike that she has a few enterprises planned for the future for even her small herd of 12. Okay. So there is the revenue stream of hides, and she would have the meat that mm-hmm. she could sell. So yep. I don't know. She isn't doing that yet, so we didn't have a figure on this herd of what that would be valued at. But it's an additional option, additional revenue stream. So it's just $22 an hour. That's the bare minimum. And honestly, she is in an area where there is a serious market for this. Good. Out west, people understand that. Uh, you know, the importance of the pasture management, the forest fire breaks and all that stuff. I I could not possibly imagine me like waltzing into <laughs> Greenwich, Connecticut, yeah. walking up to some mansion door, knocking on it with like four goats behind no me idea and saying, Do you want goats? <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to do some maintenance on your property? And they would say, nope. <laughs> <laughs> they would actually not say no, they would call the cops. <laughs> so, knowing on the one end, the total goat hobbyist is going to do nothing but spend money, spend money, spend money. Mm-hmm. On the other end, seeing where Brittany's at, 20 hours a week or less, making somewhere around $22 at the end of the day. Right. Where, where are we going with this? We got a thumbs up or thumbs down on goats. <laughs> I I am going to be historic and say neither. Neither? Yeah. I think that there are... I think that goats, more than anything else that we've looked at, have the potential to financially break even. They're just so versatile. It all depends. I was totally shocked. I couldn't believe that he didn't just give him a flat out thumbs down. And so I pushed because of two reasons. First, this wasn't historic neither. Mike did the same thing in this episode. Overall, gut factor is ducks getting a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Mm, I don't know if I can give it either. (laughs) I won't give it a thumbs down. How about that? All right. That's not too bad. So here's the thing. I think the advice and the other reason why is because... I don't have Mike on the show to be indecisive. That's more my job. Mike comes on to tell us what makes sense and what doesn't. And I could not believe his reasoning. Neither. Yeah. I think that there are... I think that goats, more than anything else that we've looked at, have the potential to financially break even. They're just so versatile. It all depends. Like, I I bashed her a little bit, not not intentionally, mind you. Like, it's not an exciting amount of money, but she is making money, and she is profitable on it. And I would give her thing a thumbs up. I would give the thing that you do a thumbs down. <laughs> and the thing that... You give all uh, the things I do a thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's your quote. I would give... <laughs> I would give hers a thumbs up and yours a thumbs down. Like, yeah, you go to Mike and Lauren, like, they're in your camp. They're just losing money on this stuff. But, like, she she is actually making some real, you know, some, some cash on it. It's a float. And, yeah, she's outdoors and can just work in wine country. And maybe she spends her All other right. 20 hours at a vineyard, I hope. <laughs> Mike and Lauren were smart. They only had two little goats. I've had like, I've had way too many. You're the goat. goat You're the goat crack addict. That's what you are. Yes, (laughs) rock bottom. And I'm gonna push you for. I'm gonna push you for this one. I think if you so for. (laughs) I think if you push me, and I will add my little caveat. I think the median person, the person right in the middle. I think they will be barely profitable so i will give this 
the smallest thumbs up that it's possible to really? give. Really? No way. Yeah, I do. I know. <laughs> I just. Because that's the thing. Because because we consider uh, Brittany to be a slam dunk, but really that yeah, thirty three thousand number is is her minimum. If she adds the other stuff in, and then she's up to before you know it, she's up to sixty or seventy a year. Now all of a sudden she's like totally viable for real. And I don't know if we've done anything else on this show yet, which is like, oh yeah, one person you could actually really make a decent living off of one of these things but i think she so far she could do it she's on her way dang man Brittany colbush history in the making yeah, history man made accountant mike thumbs up something <laughs> that i already said was a thumbs down i i gave it the tiniest thumbs up you can give it though that's the tiniest that's important <laughs> So I don't want you to misunderstand what Mike said. He's not saying that if you want to get a couple goats as a hobby on your homestead, that that's a good use of your time or that you're going to make any money from it. But if you're driven, if you're a homesteader who really wants to make this into at least a side hustle, if not something more, follow Brittany's footsteps because she's killing it. She's making more money off homesteading than anyone we've ever interviewed on the show. And she's given hope to all you goat lovers out there that maybe there's a reason, a logical one, for keeping these crazy, goofy animals around. I don't know. I'll believe it when I see it. You're giving it a thumbs up. I am I am yeah. totally like... I thought I knew you so well. I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> this whole 30 has changed you. because I'm just drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this man on the phone I'm speaking with? This is the first time since we started the home study show that accountant Mike and I disagreed. No, not the first time we disagreed that we disagreed on these ends of the spectrum. Mike thinking something was really worthwhile and me not so much. I'm going to be honest. It was a weird place to be in coming back from after the accountant Mike interview, where usually I give you this gripping, exciting reason why, even though he thinks it's a bad idea, you should still go out and do it this time around. Well, I'm not coming on here to tell you that you should go out and get goats. Don't get me wrong. Yes, I have a love-hate relationship with goats. But most of a love-hate relationship, at least 50%, is love. I've spent the last five years of my life chasing these animals down, trying to find them through the woods, keeping them in different kinds of fencing, electric fencing, high fencing, buried fencing, bad fencing. A major amount of my homesteading life has been spent with these goofy animals. And I've really come to love the ones that we've owned. Yo-Yo, our anchor goat, we've had her for four years now. We got her when she was just a little, little kid. And now she's the queen of the herd. And then there's Lido. Lido was a kid that we bottle fed. She was just a few weeks old when we bought her. Raised her on the bottle. She's reached practically puppy status. She follows us around. She'll sit next to me in a chair. And everyone who comes to visit the farm loves Lido. She's a crowd favorite. And then we have Red, a Nubian buck from an incredible line of animals. He's a great breed and he's incredibly friendly. He comes when I call him, even though he's the goat that's been here the shortest amount of time. I love our goats and that's why it's so hard to get rid of them, which is what we're doing. In fact, we're getting rid of a lot of things on our farm. The sheep, the goats, chickens, guineas, the pigs. We're getting rid of all of our livestock. And we're going to stop farming. Why? Why after the last two and a half years of us doing this show, 
encouraging you to go and start homesteading. Are we stopping? In our next episode of Homesteady, me and Kendra are going to come clean with you. What's the future of our homestead? What's Homesteady's future? You'll find out in our next episode. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it.